Welcome back. The Berkshires this time of year to me is glorious. It's a wonderful, glorious, beautiful place to be. And I'm really pleased to be here and to welcome you all back. Uh, as you know, I've been trying to paint a picture. Uh, up to this time, in some respects, it's been a little bit of a gloomy picture. American apartheid, national socialism in the ring, third, third fighters in the ring, uh, the battle of an ingenious liberal socialist pedagogue against uh, isolationism and the Red Scare in the, uh, in the Middle West in the 30s and 40s. I lived among these things. Uh, but there was another side of life, thrilling side, uh, the world of baseball, but baseball is only a child can see it. A world that enthralled us as no other world would, and yet for many of us it was a world uh, we would never see, at least in person, until much later in life. The more I look back on that world, uh, the more remarkable it becomes. No one can possibly understand the history of this, uh, this great polyglot country of ours without understanding baseball. It's much more than a sport. It came a reflection of what we are. And uh, really, it's a cornerstone of our culture. And so for just one short session here, come with me to the long-vanished baseball world created only by radio. The world of language, where words were pictures, television just a pipe dream. Let's see if we can relive for just one moment the often longed for, but still vivid, world of our youth. How many of you ever heard of uh, Tinker Stevers a Chance? Any hands here? You heard of it. How many of you ever saw Tinker Stevers a Chance? <laughs> Hope not. Uh, that great double play combination played for the Chicago Cubs uh, when they uh, last won the World Series well over 100 years ago. <laughs> but uh, when you hear Tinker Stevers a Chance, uh, it conjures up mental images of perfection, perfection in the double play, teamwork, coordination. Uh, all those kinds of things in the imagination. How many of you ever heard of Boo Rota Mac to Trotsky? Ah, I've got some, I've got some people here. Yeah, they were my tinkers that was the chance uh, when I was a kid growing up in Cleveland. And you know something? I knew exactly what they did. I knew their batting averages. I knew how they handled the ball. Uh, I knew just what they looked like. I knew how Luke Boudreau would range long was right, pick a ball off his toes, whip up, up in the air, jump in the air, and whip it down to Mac at second, just like Jeter does today in a way. And Mac would jump up in the air to miss a guy coming sliding in, trying to spike him onto the disabled list, and whip that ball over to Hal Trotsky at first. Hal Trotsky was a big guy, had the longest reach in baseball. He could hit like a Mack truck. I knew all that. And yet I'd never seen Cleveland ball game. Never saw a ball game. How'd I know all that? And the baseball cards? Well, the baseball cards, you remember those, those, uh, those cards that uh, came with that sticky bubble gum that smelled awful. It used to pile up in the corner of your room until your mother finally came and threw it away. Oh yeah, and she also threw away those baseball cards. If she hadn't, you'd be on Easy Street today. <laughs> I didn't know it all from that. I really knew it all from, from radio. It was from my imagination. And the tripwire to my imagination was a guy by the name of Jack Graney. Now, my hometown Indians in Cleveland uh, were making a great run for the pennant during the late 30s. They had some great ball clubs. They had great personnel. The problem was they had an old crap apple by the name of Oscar Bitt that was, um, that was coaching them. And they all got into fights. I think they had the greatest personnel in baseball. But in 1936, they brought up this kid by the name of Bob Feller, right off the farm in Van Meter, Iowa. He's the fastest thing that ever hit baseball. The baseball cards we had said that Feller pictured him with a barn and a target on the barn. I remember it vividly in these days. They said he was, he was tossing to the barn, but he wasn't tossing the barn. He was talking to his father in front of the barn. They lied. The thing about uh, his father was his father disappeared from that scene very quickly when Feller was 13 years old. He was so fast. He was pitching one night. It was getting a little dark. And uh, his uh, father called for a curveball. That was two fingers. But Feller didn't see that. He thought it was one finger fastball. Broke three of his father's ribs. That was the last time his father ever taught for him. 
But at age 13, they knew there was something different about this kid. He was going to be something. Well, a fellow named Messiah Slatnica, as a scout for the Cleveland Indians, went out to Van Meter, Iowa, to scout another ball player. But somebody said, you ought to go over to American Legion and see this kid playing American Legion ball. Fellow, he took one look at him, and he signed him up. They signed him up at the age of 16 and brought him to Cleveland when he was 17 years old. Now, it's an amazing thing. Cleveland Indians didn't know, you know, they didn't have much in the way of minor leagues in those days. They had them, but they weren't very active because it was a depression. Most teams couldn't afford them, uh, the minor leagues. So they brought, uh, they brought the, the feller, they bypassed the minor league where there was of it, and they brought him right up to Cleveland. He was a 17-year-old kid. So they, they weren't quite sure how he'd do against major league pitching, so they pitched him in an exhibition game. They pitched him against a team called the St. Louis Cardinals, which you know, but the ball players playing for St. Louis at that time were a group called the Gas House Gang. Any of you ever, any of you ever heard of the Gas House Gang? Yeah, you did. There was Dizzy, there was Daffy, there was Dazzy, there was Ducky, and there was Lippy. <laughs> Dizzy, Dazzy, Daffy, Ducky, and Lippy. That's uh, Dizzy Dean, Daffy Dean, Dazzy Vance, Ducky Medwick, because he ran like a duck, and Lippy Leo DeRocher, a man who, um, whose coach once said of him, this man has the uh, infinite capacity to make a bad situation worse. <laughs> a former pool ball hustler. In any event, he came up to uh, hit against those guys, and they came barreling into Cleveland. And they were National League guys, and Cleveland was American League. So they came barreling into, the, uh, into Cleveland, and they began to uh, interview him. And there was a guy named Pepper Barton on that team. They were absolutely crazy guys. You, you throw sneezing powder down the ventilating shafts in the hotel. He was a great guy. But uh, Dizzy Dean was supposed to be sort of an amazing kind of guy. He was a great pitcher. But they, uh, they interviewed him. I said, Dizzy, is it true that you never finished high school? And, yeah. I said, did you ever finish elementary school? No. Nope. Uh, how about second grade? Did you ever graduate in second grade? I said, no. Nope. And I didn't do so good in first grade either. <laughs> now, once Dean was playing in, uh, in Detroit uh, in a World Series, and actually St. Louis Cardinals, that gas house gang, they beat Detroit for the pennant in the World Series and the year before. And uh, Dean slid into second and was beamed. Not totally unconscious, they carried him off the field with a stretcher. Went to a hospital in Detroit. Next morning, the Detroit Free Press uh, ran a, a headline. X-rays of Dean's head? Find nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he and Daffy combined for 49 wins in 1934 season brought the World Series trophy to St. Louis. Anyway, they were a strong team, and uh, they were batting against uh, Feller, and they had some great hitters on that team. One of them was the player manager, a guy named Frankie Frisch. Now, he was a power hitter, but the first guy to face Feller was a uh, good old Libby Leo DeRoche. He was a great glove man. DeRoche couldn't hit much. Well, Feller struck him out. But he didn't strike him out immediately. Threw a couple of balls. One went behind DeRoche's head. And uh, another one uh, went over his head, hit the screen, bounced up into the stands, broke a chair. Well, Frisch is on deck and he's watching this. And uh, he gets up there after a Drosher strikes out and takes one strike and he takes a second strike. And after that, he's pretty much seen enough. And he starts walking toward the dugout. And the umpire calls him and says, hey, come on back here, Frankie. You got another strike coming. He says, listen, take it from me up. I'm just going out to get a glass of water. And uh, took himself right out of the game. Never came back. Great Frankie Frisch, one of the greatest hitters in baseball, took himself right out of the ball game. Well, the feller was uh, going on uh, like that. He was uh, knocking people out, uh, striking them out. He struck out uh, 15 St. Louis Browns at one time. He struck 17 Philadelphia Athletics. And uh, he was the greatest thing in the American League. Lifting the spirits in Cleveland, something fantastic. Well, now one day... Uh, he, uh, he, in another exhibition game, he faced Lefty Grove. Lefty Grove was one of the great pitchers of all time. Uh, right up there with the Walter Johnson, Rube Waldell. Grove wasn't much of a hitter. So he was facing Feller. And Feller was so fast, it's just unbelievable. He had this incredible windup. He'd bring his left leg way up over his head. I can't do it. Way down there, whip that ball down. It came from, you didn't know where it was coming from. Incredible. So he was doing that with Grove in this exhibition game. Ball went right out of Grove. He didn't even see it. 
bam, right in the catcher's mitt. Strike one. Uh, the other one came back there, bam, two, strike two. He said, couldn't even see that at all. The third one goes by, bam, even faster in the catcher's mitt. And uh, <clears throat> Greg just Greg just sitting there with that bat on the shoulder, turns to the umpire and says, you know, uh, that last one sounded low. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in another exhibition game in Cleveland uh, against the Giants, with all shit the scene, the fella, the old farm boy, just uh, slouched out there to the mound, and uh, Giants are warming up. Starts pitching a couple, raises that left leg in the sky, goes down, while well, suddenly the entire team was transfixed. Uh, they were uh, completely out of the game already. Red Smith, who was a great uh, sports writer at the time, wrote for the New York Times. You may have read stuff he wrote said this, quote, 20 seasons have passed and the small tableau, that small tableau remains vivid in the memory of the witnesses. Those who were there do not tire of describing the scene. That day, they say, though talking of some personal achievement, I saw a pitcher. Well, when the Cleveland uh, papers uh, swarmed around the 17-year-old phenom uh, feller just off the farm, he hadn't finished high school, they asked him, uh, what was the secret of success? He says, well, how do I do it? I just rear back, and where the ball goes, well, that's, that's just up to heaven. <laughs> heaven. Well, that's fine. There's only one little problem. Just letting them go. Heaven couldn't always just find the plate. And the problem with that is when heaven missed, it always missed inside and near the head. So uh, the greatest uh, ball players in the American League uh, were bailing out. Remember, in those days, they didn't have these uh, Rawlings Extra Protective S100 fancy-dancy batting helmets. They just had flannel caps, and um, these guys were bailing out. Bucky Harris of the Washington Centers uh, was coaching uh, one day against uh, Manchester <coughs> Cleveland. He said, now you go on out there and, and hit what you see, and if you don't see nothing, well, come on back. Bob Feller, the two-pitch wonder just out of Van Meter, was uh, winning ball games, setting strikeout records every time he pitched, it seemed. And uh, all that happened while Cleveland's uh, economy was nosediving. The uh, NRA hadn't worked. That was uh, deemed unconstitutional. A lot of the programs in the uh, New Deal weren't working. The economy was going from bad to worse in 38, of course. Uh, Roosevelt tried to balance the budget, things went even worse than that, and we all sort of know that the war was coming one way or another. Uh, but uh, when Feller struck out 18 batters in 1938 in the wingding of a ball game against Hal Neuhauser, Detroit, well, no one thought about those things, and people thought they could even hear the whistles uh, ring down on the old flats, the factory whistles and so forth. People smiled again on their way to the unemployment lines. Um, even the apple sellers smiled. And uh, I stopped thinking about those uh, kids on Townley Road behind me. I uh, stopped thinking about that Nazi exchange student. When uh, Hitler uh, marched uh, into Czechoslovakia, well, fortunately, we were thinking about Bob Feller and uh, 18 strikeouts against uh, Alan Neuhauser. When the war finally did break out, a uh, feller enlisted in the Navy, and um, just three days after Pearl Harbor. And I didn't get to see him, really, until after the war was over, uh, when uh, the Indians in 1948 finally did win the World Series. Back in 38, feller pitched that game against Neuhauser. Well, uh, I was there with my portable. I was there with my radio, and I saw every pitch of it. I saw every instance of it. Uh, and you could hear it just by going out on the sidewalk even without a radio because in Cleveland everybody had it on. W-L-I-W. Uh, and no one was thinking about anything else but a feller pitching 18 strikeouts against uh, the Detroit Tigers. I was absolutely positive that uh, Boudreaux's greatest shortstop ever, one of the greatest fielders ever, even better than uh, uh, second baseman Tom Dore, who Bobby Dore played for Boston's great ball player. I had both baseball cards, but I had to trade away Dore. At one time, I, uh, I somehow or other, I was missing Boudreaux, and I traded away Dore to get Boudreaux. But I, then I wanted to trade to get Dore back. And who did I trade for? Well, when we went up to the rapid stop and got cards, they weren't all American League cards. They were National League cards, too. And we didn't know those National League players. And I had this uh, one, one player, 
for the something called the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> and uh, his name was Van Lingo Mungo. <laughs> and I could trade that guy because the guy's name was so weird, I could trade him and I traded him back for Bobby Dorr and got Bobby Dorr back. But we didn't know much about Brooklyn, except they had these weird players like uh, Van Mingo Mungo. <laughs> and the uh, great thing about, uh, about Jack Graney was that I knew what was going on in the uh, Cleveland Indians games, even when the Indians were away. Uh, and that Jack Graney brought it to me wherever they were. Well, if they were in Detroit, he'd bring it to me. <coughs> Stadium, Chicago Comiskey Park. Uh, Boston Fenway, of course, in New York, uh, he brought it from Yankee Stadium. Uh, but um, there's always this funny sort of thing when they were away in the press box. It was just sort of a ticking sound in the background. I never paid much attention to that. But the uh, thing about Graney was he was always in great danger of being hit by a foul ball. Whenever he was away, it seemed that uh, the balls would come right up in the press box and bang, they'd hit right up there in their press box. The guy next to him say, hey, 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 Jack, duck, it's coming up there. Bang, whoa, that was a close one. You could say that again, absolutely a close one. Well, I went all through the 30s uh, and early 40s thinking, huh, poor Jack Rainey might get killed. I remember never might hear the end of one of those ball games. But he was very lucky, this Jack Rainey. He never got hit. Well, things were improved in Cleveland when the war broke out. It's a Rust Belt town after all. Scrap metal dealers who've been driving truck between Cleveland, Youngstown, Toledo. Suddenly those guys are overnight millionaires. But uh, things began to move down on the flats. Public Steel was going full blast. Warner and Swayze, Chevrolet plant based down there, was making tanks for the, uh, for the Army. And uh, things were going pretty full blast. So things took a turn for the better. A bunch of guys began to come up from the hill country in Kentucky and West Virginia to work in those mills. And uh, we even got people like Rosie the Riveter came in. A lot of women went to work. The uh, apple sellers had all but disappeared from the streets in downtown Cleveland. The unemployment lines also disappeared, and folks had some money in their jeans. Of course, competition in the American League sort of crumbled. As the good guys like Feller had gone off to war, Ted Williams went off to war, Maggio, all the rest. Which, you know, they were even watching girls baseball down at, uh, at the stadium, and it was darn good baseball, as a matter of fact. I think they made a movie about it not, not too long ago. Uh, Jack Rainey just kept broadcasting through the war just as if nothing had happened. And they were even <clears throat> broadcasting these games, I understand, of kids overseas. Uh, the uh, men in the service keep their morale up. And uh, we were in the middle of tinfoil that drives, scrap metal drives, paper drives and all. But we always had uh, the ball game on while we were doing that. It was a patriotic thing to do and we loved it. Of course, um, after the war, when Feller finally came back from the Navy, in the Pacific with uh, eight battle stars. I finally saw him because uh, my Uncle Abe, the scrap metal dealer, well, he now had a box seat behind uh, home plate. And I suddenly realized that uh, Jack Rainey, Jack Rainey had been broadcasting the uh, WLIW uh, from right in that uh, downtown studio all the time. He never went to a Briggs Stadium, he never went to Mr. Park, he never went to Fenway, he never went to Yankee Stadium, not nah. just there in uh, W-L-I-W all the time. And those uh, great balls hitting the uh, catcher's mitt when the uh, fellow would pitch, uh, there was just people uh, hanging on the table. And those <laughs> foul balls that came up in the press box with the broom handle being uh, pounded into the ground. <laughs> and uh, all I was doing was listening to the ball games, uh, uh, courtesy of Western Union, uh, something that ticking came over. Well, uh, S1C was a strike one call and uh, S2F uh, was strike two foul. Those are the balls that came up in the press box. Uh, that's all it was. All the rest was grainy. Well, grainy in my imagination. It's a letdown when I finally did find out about it. I didn't want to believe it at first. Frankly, sometimes I wish I'd never found out about it. Brooklyn Eagle, 1846. In the sundown perambulations of late, uh, through the outer parts of Brooklyn, we have observed several parties of youngsters playing bass. Certain game of ball. Let us go forth a while, get better air in our lungs. Let us leave our close rooms. The game of ball is glorious. That's Walt Whitman. You know, Brooklyn's a strange place. They were playing baseball down there in Brooklyn. Uh, 15 years before the Civil War. But all that we kids in Cleveland knew about Brooklyn 
outside of those Van Lingo Mungo cards. If you ask a guy, are you from Brooklyn? More likely the answer would be, uh, yeah, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Me, that William Bendix guy was typical Brooklyn. He lay there dying on the battlefield. He wanted to know what the Brooklyn Dodgers done the last of the night. <clears throat> Little we know as we wrapped ourselves up in the imagined radio world of Jack Craney's Cleveland on Lake Erie that there was a whole world of baseball happening in the borough they called Brooklyn on the East River. Little we know that it was a place where subway cars roared above elevated tracks and in uh, tunnels under the East River. Uh, little do we know that it's a place where people live day and night. Their entire lives maybe never even saw or hardly ever saw the sun. Where kids played stickball in the streets with air sots rubber balls they called Spaldines. Where they counted bases, they counted hits by the number of sewers they hit. Whereas Cleveland, even in the height of the Depression, we had a lot of vacant land, so we played on grass, we played with bases, we played with Hillary and Bradsby bats. Not in Brooklyn. Little we know that Brooklyn kids, Brooklyn people, in a sense, were really a, an ethnic mix, an extraordinary ethnic mix. Most of them were Orthodox Jews, African Americans, Poles, Irish Catholics, Italians, Greek Orthodox, Slovenians, Slovakians, and uh, Lord only knows who else. They lived in places called Flatbush and Canarsie. Most of them, uh, their folks, uh, had quite frankly been refugees. An extraordinary thing about Brooklyn and baseball. Most of the uh, people in Brooklyn that watch baseball are people that were first generation or like most second generation. Come through Ellis Island. They've gone uh, through Ellis Island and directly to an ethnic neighborhood in Brooklyn and stayed there and very often never emerged from there. Uh, it was an interesting thing about baseball because that's the only thing that united them. Little do we know that the things we call chocolate phosphates out in Cleveland, they called egg creams, but there was no egg in them whatsoever. Uh, and uh, that the entire rest of them were living in stress. They were living in stress, sort of a complex, sort of like a stepchild, literally and figuratively in the shadow of that great metropolis across the river called Manhattan. You see, Brooklyn had once been an independent city, but in 1898, by an act of the state legislature, they were forced to become part of the city of New York, part of those five boroughs, you know, Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, uh, and uh, Queens, and Staten Island. And uh, the enforced status shaped the character of Brooklyn uh, for many years, years to come. Many people uh, in Brooklyn had grown uh, to maturity bearing that infernal burden. Uh, they were outspoken, they were truculent, and they had their own language. They called it Brooklynese. <laughs> Carl Erskine was a, was a great pitcher for Brooklyn. Uh, one of the best they ever had, great Dodger pitcher. And one day he was uh, pitching, and he wasn't having his greatest day. That happens to pitchers, you'll notice that from time to time. They don't always have their best day. So um, it seems that uh, he walked a guy, gave up a single, and then he walked another guy, and he had the bases loaded. Nobody had. Well, as you know, one more walk forces in a run. Guy in the stand says, come on, Oiskin, we're with you. We're all behind you. Ball one. Oiskin, come on. The guys in Flatbush, we love you. We know you can do it, boy. Ball two. Hey, Oiskin, <clears throat> only two more. You're going to get them. You're going to strike about this. No hitter. We no hitter. We with you, Oiskin. Ball three. Hey, Oiskin, you can do it. We know you can do it. You're going to do it. Ball four. Hey, dress it. Throw that bum out of there. <laughs> Bridge, Manhattan had skyscrapers. Wall Street, theater, great ocean liners docked in Manhattan, cargo ships docked in Brooklyn. Broadway had a glamorous name, Flatbush. That eh, sounded sort of funny. But most of all, they played uh, in the Bronx. Uh, Manhattan boasted the uh, invincible giants of John McGraw in the early 30s, and of course the legendary baseball dynasty of Joe McCarthy and the Yankees in the 40s. And uh, the unrelenting hatred of uh, those baseball clubs unified that entire pugnacious mix in Brooklyn, as did no other factor in this great melting pot of ours called the U.S. of A. 
I mean, those Brooklyns just hated the Giants and they hated the Bombers, uh, something fierce. But in learning baseball, they learned America. Little do we know in Cleveland and in the uh, Brooklyn of Van Lingo Mungo, the Dodgers, or dim bums as we used to call them, they were affectionately called that. They weren't a baseball club, they were a religion. In a strange misfit Rube Goldberg baseball field they played on, that one a ballpark, it was a cathedral. It was uh, named after a guy named Charles Hercules Ebbets, and it originally uh, converted it from a pig town garbage trunk in 1913. That time it formed been a place where uh, pigs were uh, fed, and it still smelled when, they, when they'd opened it up. But uh, this Ebbets Field was the most mixed up ballpark ever. It was built on three different, the outfield was built on three different slopes to begin with. Uh, it had um, 289 different angles uh, to really confound a uh, visiting team. And there was a guy named Abe Stark who was a clothier and he'd uh, erected this sign way out in the outfield, hit this sign, win a free suit out in his place on Pitkin Avenue. And uh, there was a uh, Schaefer beer sign. When the H uh, lit up in the Schaefer beer sign, you got a hit. When the E uh, uh, lit up, there was an error. That wasn't enough. Uh, they had this uh, lady that no one ever saw called Gladys Gooding, uh, who uh, played the organ. And when the, um, <coughs> in a girder, someplace under the upper deck, and when the uh, visiting team uh, warmed up, she would play to each his own. <laughs> and then there was, uh, this nutty band called the Dodger Symphony that couldn't play much music, but they were funny as, as all get out. And finally, there was an old lady uh, who everybody could see named Hilda Chester, sat out in the bleachers ringing a cowbell the entire game with a great big sign that said, Hilda's here, and uh, writing love notes to the outfielders. Uh, but the most incongruous thing about Dodger, uh, the Dodgers all together, stranger even than Ebbets Field and all these characters, was that the most beloved Dodger baseball icon of all, the voice of all for 15 years, from 1939 to 53, was a loyal son of the Old South, a Confederate. Who was he? He was a guy by the name of Red Barber. He was still fighting a civil war when he came up. <laughs> uh, now, uh, Barber, a real son of the Old South, born in Mississippi, raised in, uh, in Central Florida. That's not a place where they have uh, Tony beaches and condos. Usually, his people down there were people who reviled the ethnic mix who were Barber's audience in Brooklyn. Larry McPhail brought Red Barber up from Cincinnati. Now, Cincinnati, as you know, is the very bottom of the state of Ohio, practically part of Kentucky. And uh, he'd been broadcasting down there. Brought him up uh, in 1939, and McPhail was a great promoter, actually introduced night baseball. When he brought uh, Red Barber up, why the uh, Yankees and the Giants and the Dodgers had this pack, they uh, certainly weren't broadcasting uh, much baseball on radio. They figured it kept the fans away from the stands. Point of fact, Red Barber broke through that with Larry McPhail. They started broadcasting the Dodger game. So, of course, the Yankees and Giants started too. And you know what happened? Fan base expanded exponentially. They reached women. For the first time, women began to come to the ballparks, began to listen to ball games. It was a great, great move, entrepreneurial for him. Well, now, Barber, uh, it turns out, was as quirky and asymmetrical as uh, Ebbets Field itself. He wasn't just an announcer. Uh, he was a storyteller extraordinaire. See, he came from the South, came from points. Father was a railroad engineer, and he would come home at night, get out of his grease-filled overalls, and. Uh, and Red would sit there and just listen to him recount these stories all night long. But his mother was a grammar teacher in uh, school. She was an extraordinarily good teacher, and she insisted on precise grammar. That combination of storytelling and uh, a precise grammar, together with a sort of an innate genius, made of this guy, Red Barber, one of the most extraordinary announcers baseball has ever had. They've really never uh, equaled him since. He could tell you what was happening on the playing field, not only uh, accurately, but colorfully as well. Oh, and there was something else. Being that he was a true son of the Old South, you may have noticed this in some Southerners, the further they get away from the South, the more severe their accent becomes. <laughs> and uh, so it was with him. But he used the nuances and the metaphors and the idioms of the Old South to great advantage. Uh, and uh, these things uh, at first confounded 
and dumbfounded the people in Brooklyn never heard anything like it before. But pretty soon they came to endear him to the, uh, those inhabitants of Flatbush and Canarsie. Bob Edwards, who uh, co-hosted a show on NPR with the barber, uh, called him an etymologist's dream. Ebbets Field, for example, that strange Rube Goldberg combination of a ball field, well, that became the rhubarb patch. And uh, uh, if, uh, if the Dodgers were well ahead in the last of the ninth, uh, well, they were sitting in the catbird seat. Nobody originally knew what that meant. So he even wrote a book called Rhubarb Patch, uh, uh, Rhubarb in the Catbird Seat. Did I mention uh, Barber was an author who wrote six books? His game descriptions were filled with the idiom of the Southland. You might get something like this. In a, in a pitcher's duel where the hometown boy was tiring a little, you might get, well, there's no action in the doctor bull, Dodger bullpen yet, but they're beginning to wiggle their toes a little. <laughs> or you might get when the Dodgers tied a game with the Giants in the bottom of the ninth and was going to go into extra innings, he might say something like, put the roast back in the oven, Mrs. Barber. It'll be a while before this game's over. <laughs> the Dodgers were worshipped in Brooklyn, and Red Barber was their high priest. As his language became their language, a strange anomaly would occur all over the, uh, all over the borough. Uh, parochial school kids wound up in the office of the Mother Superior, calling kid next to him a suck egg mule, though nobody, not the uh, Mother Superior, the nuns, the kids, nobody knew what the heck that meant. But it became part of the vernacular. Uh, his um, uh, terminology infected Brooklyn, and he presided over the, as the voice of the Dodger uh, baseball club for 15 years. And uh, they remained a part of the vernacular of Brooklyn long after he left. Uh, in a uh, very searing uh, novel called Brooklyn Boy by uh, Alan <coughs> There's a um, character by the name of Alan Schlossberg who describes what it was like to be a, in Brooklyn when uh, Barber was in the, on the air. Maybe a number of you were in Brooklyn when Barber was on the air. See if this uh, comports to what you can remember, because it's exactly the kind of thing that I remember when Jack Brady was on the air in Cleveland. Quote, now, Barber was the voice of the bones and the conscience of the borough. When Red was on the air, you could hear his special phrases everywhere you went, on the beaches or front stoops, at drug stores, candy stores, or parlor or bar barber shops, at lunch wagons or pool halls, car radios, portables, or consoles. Uh, he was soft-spoken, scrupulous, knowledgeable, rhythmic, a humorous, down-home eloquent, always eloquent. His voice filled the streets, shops, and seasides of the borough, surrounded it and suffused us with the sweetness and moral light. Uh, a very different voice from that older singer, Walt Whitman, in quote. Of course, you learn much more than uh, just baseball, Red Barber. Uh, he painted verbal pictures uh, like an artist with a palette. He was a Gainsbourg and a Van Gogh, all wrapped in one. Uh, but uh, it was a lazier time than in the 30s and 40s. At that time, uh, announcers uh, weren't rushed into doing commercials uh, every time they uh, relieved a pitcher or changed an inning. No, it was a time, more of a time for stories and announcers like Barber and Rainey, and they became personalities. Today, commercial characters like the Geico Gecko are the personalities that bombard us, uh, and you know that. But at that time, uh, you know, people didn't have enough money to pay for those, those commercials, so you didn't have that many. So in the 30, uh, 30s uh, in radio days, just as in, the, uh, in Brooklyn, just as in the heartland, uh, you had maybe only two or three or four commercials broadcast. That's all the sponsors could afford. Barbers of broadcast like uh, Jack Brainy's, they captured the, the choreography of the game, the pace, and the rhythm of the game. Uh, but unlike uh, Grainy's, they could also be filled with remarkable references to classic literary works. This guy read Barber could as well quote from Arnold Toynbee or Taylor Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, as from Dizzy Pee Wee or the Duke. Remarkable guy. One day, when Fielder kicked away two balls during an inning, but the third ball he made a great play on, he said, um, hmm, like the ancient mariner, he stoppeth one of three. <laughs> what? You all had the rhyme in the Ancient Mariner in high school, don't you? You remember it? What, uh, it is an Ancient Mariner, and he stopped with one of three by thy long gray beard uh, and glittering eye. Now, wherefore stoppest thou thee? Uh, the Mariner has stopped three men going to a wedding. Uh, it's a glint of recognition I noticed out there in a number of you. I had it. We all had it in high school. Let me tell you. 
Jack Brandy and his bombiest day. Uh, would never have come up with that one. <laughs> well, I try this one on for science. Maybe only the English lit majors here uh, remember this one. Dodge a leadoff man hit a double, and then no one else got a hit. They left him stranded on second. So Red remarked, they left him languishing there like the prisoner of Chillon. <laughs> now, come on. The reference might have qualified as the basis at that time of Clifton Fadiman's information police today, maybe Jeopardy. But uh, the reference is, of course, uh, to uh, Lord Byron's sonnet on Chillon, a prisoner of Chillon. Don't ask me about Jack Rainey on that one. If you ask Rainey about that, he'd say, Who's Byron, the shortstop? <laughs> The arrival of uh, Jackie Robinson in 1947 was a great, uh, great traumatic event in the life of Red Barber. Now, when he heard it was coming, uh, he told his wife, you know, I'm going to have to resign now. I can't possibly broadcast this. His wife said, well, you know something, if they asked to resign, said, no, they haven't. Well, you just broadcast the, the first one and see what happens. He did. Uh, it actually... The arrival of Jackie Robinson caused an enormous, drastic attitudinal adjustment in the old Confederate barber. The remarkable stoicism and the bravery of this splendid athlete under a withering barrage of beanings and uh, spikings and brushbacks and racial epithets uh, moved him uh, as nothing uh, had before. He looked to, into his own soul and didn't like what he saw there. Uh, he underwent an epiphany. And he became a convert, convert to the cause of African-American integration into baseball. And like uh, many converts, he became a proselyte. Before long, and with an enlightened Southern convert broadcasting, the remarkable polyglot Dodger fans took Robinson into their own hearts. He's a ball player. He was their ball player. He was a guy like they were an outsider, an underdog, battling upstream against the current. And that was all that really mattered. Robinson didn't disappoint. In 1947, he made Rookie of the Year, despite the beanings and the brushbacks and the spikings and the epithets. This is perhaps baseball's finest hour. But only two months later, uh, in the American League and in Cleveland, uh, without much notoriety, Bill Veck uh, brought up Larry Doby. Now, that was no bed of roses either, but in this case, remember those kids were coming up from West Virginia and Kentucky, working uh, steel mills, well, they were still there. That was a more hostile audience that Robinson probably had in Brooklyn. <laughs> About one year later, Vec brought up the ageless legend Satchel Page. Maybe some of you may remember him. Uh, both Page and Doby would make the Hall of Fame, and uh, with uh, Page and uh, Doby playing on the team, uh, the Indians won the World Series in 1948. That was the first time in 28 years, and I gotta tell you, skin color was very soon forgotten. Uh, Page, who dominated the Negro Leagues for over a quarter of a century, was one of the most spectacular characters that uh, baseball has ever produced. With a twinkle in his eye, uh, he hit Cleveland like an aurora borealis. <laughs> Raised in reform school, and he often used to say, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. His age was listed as 42, but uh, most people thought that as a result of the uh, bad uh, uh, birth records kept in Alabama around the turn of the century, he would more likely more like 52 uh, at the time. But uh, said uh, Page, you know, age is just a matter of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. <laughs> Joe DiMaggio would bat against Page in an exhibition game, called him the greatest uh, pitcher ever bat against. Satchel had beaten uh, Dizzy Dean in an exhibition game, two to one. Dean was the finest pitcher at the time. Uh, he was a showman with a great sense of humor. Son, he would say, what kind of pitch would you like to miss? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. I got a single windup, a double windup, a triple windup, and a hesitation pitch. He said, I got a fastball, a jump ball, a change up, a slider. I got a sidearm, a submarine ball, and a midnight rider, and if that doesn't do it, I got an epileptic snake ball. <laughs> <laughs> Once at the beginning of an inning, he told his infielders, you know some uh, running is bad for your health, so sit down. <laughs> they all sat down. He said, he described about the sound. Jack Greeny in Cleveland and uh, Red Barber in uh, Brooklyn broadcast the searing drama and the excitement of those 1947-1948 seasons, breakthrough seasons of Robinson, Doby, 
uh, and page, perhaps the most dramatic and critical uh, seasons in the history of our great pastime. And uh, they reached a rap audience, every minute of them. Uh, every minute of them was broadcast on radio. No television, uh, no instant replay, no videotape. Nothing like that, just the sounds of the announcer's voice, the sounds of the crowd, and oh yeah, the crisp clarity of our imagination. They were riveting broadcast. When the Dodgers finally left Brooklyn in 1957, the whole town went into mourning. Uh, Ebbets Field, the uh, cathedral of Dodger, when he eventually succumbed to the almighty buck, it was uh, demolished, I think they made something of it, uh, like a, an apartment house complex. Walter O'Malley, who moved him out there, was uh, really mud in Brooklyn. Someone once told me in Brooklyn at the time, there was a story going around, if Hitler, Stalin, and O'Malley were in the same room, and you had a pistol with only two bullet, bullets, which two would you shoot? The guy said, O'Malley, both of them want to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> but he was still pretty famous as Evans Field. Uh, I don't believe my league park in Cleveland ever made it in the movies, but Evans Field made it in the movie Heist with Gene Hackman uh, and Danny DeVito. Uh, Heist says uh, to DeVito, you know something, with enough preparation, uh, you can steal anything. You could even steal Ebbets Field. DeVito shot back. Yeah, it's impossible it's not there uh, anymore. And <laughs> Hackman immediately shoots back. See what I tell you. <laughs> Both the uh, Giants and the Dodgers eventually left New York for California. Uh, the Giants, of course, went to San Francisco. Dodgers to L.A. In the uh, first uh, game of the Giants, it happened to be against the Dodgers. And uh, both the uh, mayors of both teams were out there on the field before the game, uh, uh, and they took the field. And a whole series of sports writers, including, again, the great Red Smith, was there. And he described what happened on the field just before the game. After sundry introductions, the mayors of San Francisco and Los Angeles were George Christopher and Norris uh, Poulsen. Well, they took the field. With Poulsen at bat, San Francisco mayor, Christopher pitched from the mound. Mayor Christopher bounced the pitch in front of the plate. He then uh, muffed the catcher's return toss, heaved one behind the batter, finally flung another one inside that Paulson tapped weakly toward the mound. Incredibly, uh, Mayor Poulson, the first citizen of the Dodgers' new home, took off down the third baseline for third base. <laughs> Said Smith. For one eerie moment, veterans of the baseball beat had the uneasy feeling they never left Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> There's a recent docudrama, Baseball, Ken Burns uh, describes baseball as a haunted game where every player is measured against the ghosts of all who have come before. Uh, of course, for those of us who grew up uh, with radio, whether in Cleveland or Brooklyn, the images of those ghosts, perfection itself, they can never be equal for any of us, by any modern day player, no matter what they do, because they live on in our youthful imagination. And that image, honed by the likes of a Jack Brainy or a Red Barber, that will never be erased. Bob Feller will always, to me, be the Bob Feller who uh, uh, lifted that leg way up in the air, that left leg came down like an angry manifestation of the heavens, uh, throwing to uh, batters who were shrinking away uh, bailing out of the batter by some of the greatest hitters in baseball. He'll never be the uh, Bob Feller who pitched on in the 50s, the William uh, Andrew Robert Feller Incorporated who turned into a human mint. Uh, baseball, Burns continues, is about a time and timelessness. It's about failure and loss, unpredictability and hope. And finally, it's about coming home. He's right. Traveling back to those radio days in Brooklyn uh, with uh, Jack Brainy in my portable zenith. I am coming home. Of course, the heyday of uh, radio baseball in Cleveland was in the 30s and 40s. Long time ago, and Jack Brainy didn't have the metaphors and the colorful homilies of a red barber. Brainy never chided himself as being a suck egg mule or sat in a catbird seat. Idioms which endured the old son of the Confederacy. So to that uh, ethnic mix of Dodger and Yankee fans so infinitely different from himself. I don't believe uh, Graney ever published a book about baseball or anything else for that matter. And I guess compared to the Cosmopolitan New York, New York market, the uh, bushes of old Rust Belt Cleveland there was sort of like something akin to the minor leagues. Especially during those days in the 30s, 
uh, when um, the economy was crumbling, we all knew war was coming. But it was a time when Cleveland desperately needed heroes. Baseball gave them to us. Uh, and it was a time when, to the many thousands who couldn't afford the 50 cents to get into League Park, uh, the ticket of admission to the uplift that baseball brought, what was it? It was just a little Zenith portable radio. Uh, Jack Rainey uh, has long disappeared into the dustbin of history. Go out to Cleveland today, there are very few people, if any, that even know who he was. But the baseball world that Jack Rainey brought to me Long before I ever witnessed the ball game, that world is still very real. And the memories of that double play combination of Boudreau to Mac to Trotsky, that uh, great playing combination I never even saw until long after the war was over. The wild but devastating young Bob <coughs> Feller, who I also didn't see until long after the war was over, are as vivid to me now as they were to me as a kid growing up. Uh, in the gloomiest days of the 30s. They were my guys in the field of dreams. They were my guys coming out of the cornfield. They were then and they remain to me as vivid uh, as I'm sure the Duke and Pee Wee and Jackie and Roy and Lippy Leo uh, that the old redhead portrayed still are today in the minds and hearts of thousands of Brooklyn kids who never got to Ebbets Field, even though most of the kids are undoubtedly a long way from Brooklyn today. You know, it's a fantasy that was painted during dark times, but in vibrant colors and with an indelible brush. Those colors will never fade. Comes right down to it, I guess that's what baseball is really all about, isn't it? Thank you.